See, when we walk with Jesus, we, we asked this question last week, like, like, how will my neighborhood be different if I take a prayer walk? If I start intentionally getting out of my house and praying for the people that live on my street, I had people say, Pastor, I, I live in a dirt road, so I got in my car and I drove down and I started pointing at houses and I started praying for places. And, and, and I just want to encourage you. I want to be a voice that encourages you. When, when you start getting into that mode of realizing that the kingdom is greater, watch out. God's going to start doing things that, that only he can do. So let's, let me show you a little bit about what when, when you signed up to to take the prayer walk challenge. Let me show you what took place. Now, this is a map. So we were able to capture uh, the neighborhood that you were in. Now, just be careful. I'm not going to put your name up, what neighborhood. But I want you to see that there's a couple that are in um, all the way up there in Chicago and Illinois. They walked online. They were a part of this house. And and this couple actually, they're like, hey, I'm in. They're like, they download the, the journal. They pray. They give to the big give. Guess what? They're seriously in up there. All the way in Athens and Roswell up in Georgia. And then all the way down in Port St. Lucie and Tampa. And, and the greater Jacksonville area. Watch, watch what happens when we zoom in a little bit and you get to see the, the city. Look, what, look at the, the area of Jacksonville that was covered in prayer. That someone says, I'm going to walk around my neighborhood. So remember... Doing a prayer walk is simply, God, help me to see where you're working and help me to be a part of it. So when we realize that God wants to use us to be a part of it, we'll see the difference made. Now, let's, let's look at Ocean Way. Hello? Let's look at the north side. I want you to see something and, and, and recognize something pretty powerful that took place this past week. And that's that almost every neighborhood on the north side of this town was covered by somebody that walked around that neighborhood and said, God, I'm going to pray for it. Now, if you live in Black Hammock Island, there's more people way out past Cedar Point Road, that way out. You're, you're, you're a part of that too. Can we just celebrate what God did this past week? So let me be an encouragement to you. Don't stop. Keep praying. Keep walking. Keep believing for your neighbors. Keep looking for opportunities to, to have a conversation, to invite them to the house of God, to tell them that, hey, if you ever need anything, I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to, to be that voice in your life. So today we're going to talk about this. Like, like, here's the big question. It's not just how will my neighborhood be different if I, if I walk with Jesus, but, but how will I be different? See, when you walk with Jesus, you're going to be different. You're not going to be like everybody else. Shake your head if you understand what I'm saying. Hello? I'm not like everybody else. Hello? Why? Because I walk with Jesus. Because I'm following Christ. And, and last week we, we, um, we talked about Jacob. And how Jacob had this beautiful dream. And he was in between where he lived and where he belonged. So Jacob is, 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 is in a place. And, and Jacob, he like deceives his brother. When he deceives his brother, he steals the blessing from his dad. And, 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 and he actually stole his birthright as well when he was young. And, and, and Jacob's mom kind of set it up. But Jacob's mom's like, 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 Jacob, I don't want you marrying one of them women from, from this town, from this place. Because they, they lived in Canaan. And I want you to marry uh, somebody that's a part of the family. So she, she sends him to Haran. And, and Jacob is in between. So he's by himself. All he has is the staff. By himself. He's on the way. And he takes a rock and he lays down beside this river area and God speaks to him. And he speaks to him in a dream. And in the dream, God reminds him of the promise that he gave his grandfather and the promise that he gave his father. The promise that he probably heard them quote over and over and over again. That God said that your offspring will be as numerous as the dust on the ground, that, that all of humanity will be blessed because of you, because of your family, and because of what he's going to do in your life. And, and when he has this dream, he sees this ladder that goes from earth to heaven, and he realizes that God's in top of, at the top of this and speaking to him that he has access to heaven. But God reminds him over and over. And I think that we just need to remind ourselves that when we're in between certain places... That he reminds us that he is with us. He says, Jacob, he says, you're not alone in this. He says, I will be with you. And the promise isn't just to be with him. The promise is that God will make it happen. He will bring it to pass. Know this, that his promise and his plan for your life, he can handle it and he can make it happen. But guess what? He stays with you until he finishes it. Boy, that's a great place to celebrate. He stays with you until you finish it. So... 
Jacob, at the, at, after he has this, he, he realizes, he takes the rock and he stands it on end and he, and he pours oil on it. And when he pours oil on the, on the rock, he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. See, that was the moment that he became aware of God's presence. The moment that you become aware that God is with you is the moment that you realize that, hey, hey, God's got something for me. God can do something in me and he can do something through me because I start seeing him. So he was aware in that moment. The moment that you become aware, aware of God's presence is the moment that he starts moving in your life. So, so surely the Lord is, this is what we talked about last week, surely the Lord is in this place. And I need to be aware of it. Now let's fast forward 20 years. If we fast forward 20 years. So we read Genesis chapter 28. Now we're going to jump into Genesis chapter 32. In between those 20 years, so he's on his way because he's looking for a woman. I mean, he's looking for a wife because that's what his mom said. She said, go there and wait until, you know, and then I want you to marry a certain person. And, and he goes and he gets to this, this uh, where they're, they're, they're having water. And then he's like, hey, does anybody know Laban? Laban's like my uncle, man. And, 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 I just, and they're like, yep, we know exactly who he is. Guess what? Here comes one of his daughters, Rachel. And he's like, whew. She's the one. Love at first sight. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he gives her a, a ring, gives her gold and all these different things. She runs back and tells dad. And, and he's like, hey, I want to marry your daughter. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if you're a parent and someone came up to you and said that, you'd be like, have you lost your ever-loving mind? Like, like we need to get to know each other a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we don't just walk up and say, I want to marry. You know? that, that's like red flag, you know. <laughs> but, but, but he's like, okay, you stay here. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to serve in the house for seven years. And I'll give you my daughter. And it says he, it was like days to him. He's like, ooh, she must have been like, like everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, like ooh. Um, at the end of seven years, he tells Laban, he says, all right, I want my wife. Bring her. Let's go. You know, let's marriage time. And they, they, they do the whole marriage ceremony and everything. And Laban brings her to him. And then the Bible says that, that he woke up the next morning and it wasn't Rachel, but it was her sister Leah that he had just gotten married to. And he's like, what have you done to me? Here, now, now, let's be real. You got to read this, those, those chapters in between. And you'll realize that, that Leah, the Bible describes her, Leah had weak eyes. That's all they talk about her. Leah had weak eyes. But Rachel had a nice form. I don't, like, this is scripture, okay? So, so he was attracted to one, but not the other, but he got like, like they with the whole switcheroo, and he went to him, he says, what have you done to me, Laban? You gave me the, the, the girl with weak eyes, okay? That's, that's code for whatever you want to put in the blank, okay? So you gave me her, and I wanted her, you know what I'm saying? He's like, okay, just finish out the week, finish out the marriage. It was a whole cultural thing, and I will give you the other one, but you got to commit to give me seven more years. See, Laban, he's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> 14 years, okay, for one woman. Well, that's serious commitment right there, okay? But, but he had to commit, but Laban realized that, that God's presence, God's favor, and God's blessing was on his life because of Jacob. He started seeing things happen around him and noticing that, that good things were happening because he was in his life. And Jacob's like, giddy up, let's go. At the end of seven years, so at the end of seven years, his family's growing, everything's growing. He's a, he's a sheep herder and, and all the, the flock is like increasing in every way if you read it. But then he looks at and, he, and, he, and he's praying and God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home because this isn't the promised land. You're not living in the promised land. You need to go back home and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to put favor on your life, and you're going to prosper. Now, he had prospered. And he's like, okay, Lord, I'll go back. But here's the tension. He knew what was back. He knew that Esau was back. He knew that the last moment that he talked to Esau and talked to family was mom sent him away because Esau said, when dad dies, you die. Because I will kill you because you stole my blessing. I don't want anything to do with you. And that's one reason why he left. So it's a whole 20-year span and Jacob is going home because God said to go home. 
And Jacob has two wives. I don't know how you can have two wives or afford two wives or do. That's the Old Testament. Okay, so let's be New Testament today. One and done. All right, that's it. All right, because you can only afford one. Here we go. So, so the Lord instructs Jacob. You can laugh. It's okay. And and Jacob's like, okay, I'm going home. But he knows he has to face Esau. And here's where we pick up the story. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two female servants. And 11 sons and crossed the fort of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent all over all the possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Verse 25, when, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched and as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said to him, let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Boy, he loves, I'm like, like, he wants to be blessed. He knows that God's got a blessing for him. He's like, I'm going to hold on. Verse 27, the man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. And the man said to him, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you want to know my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. So today we're going we're gonna to talk about this. Surely the Lord is in this place. When he is in your life, you will be different because of it. I just believe that God wants us to be different. I believe that God's got a greater plan for us. I believe that God's got great things in store for your life. I, I love that, that Jacob, Jacob was different. He, what, what happened to him? He touched his hip and he walked different. I think the, the first thing you've got to realize is that your walk will be different when you walk with Jesus. There are certain places you will not go. There are certain conversations you will not have. There are certain attitudes that you will not like, like enjoy because you will walk with Jesus. And, and it's your walk that should be noticeable and visible. Anybody who follows Christ, you shouldn't be like, like the secret Christian, like, like I'm just a believer, but nobody really knows I'm a believer because I act one way at work and one way at home and, and I'm somewhere like this. Guess what? That's not being a believer. Believing and following Jesus is a commitment of faith that says, I'm going to live for him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, and on leap year, I'll do it twice. Hello? Come on now. Think about this. It's, it's, it's going all in. Can you say all in? So, so the first thing that I noticed in the scripture is that Jacob was different because of his contact with the Lord. Now, when you read this, you realize that he's wrestling with a man. You're like, who is this man? When you listen to theologians and, and, and writers, they say that this man, what they're pointing out is this man was the exact representation of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. They say he was wrestling with Christ. He was wrestling with the plan that God has for his life. So there's two plans that are at work here. There's, a, there's Jacob's plan, and then there's the Lord's plan. In your life, there's two plans. There's your plan. How many, how many love it when your plan works out? Four honest people. Okay. Like, 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 I love it when a plan works out. But then there's God's plan. And you're like, you're like, I don't really care for that plan too much because I got to face certain things I really don't want to face. I got to go through things I, I really don't want to go through. But, but we love our plan because we are the author of it. See, Jacob's plan is he was moving from one place to another. He was in the process of moving his family. Guess what? He was moving two wives, 11 kids, all these dogs, cats, every animal you can ever imagine, two entire camps. He went to this place with nothing, and he was about to return, and he had two camps of people. Well, that's moving. Moving is frustrating. How many enjoy moving? Let's do this again. Oh, one person. How many really enjoy moving? Now, now I love a new house. I love uh, new places and new spaces. But I hate the move. I feel like the move sometimes will try to kill you. You know what I'm saying? Because now that I've lived in this, this is the longest I've lived in one house for, and for our entire marriage. And, and I'm looking at my house going, boy, it would be nice to live in a different one. But guess what? Boy, I don't know what to do with all this stuff. Hello? I got, I'm like, you just keep accumulating. I need to hire somebody to downsize 
what I have so that I can actually move into another place. But, but considering everything, I'm just like, praise the Lord. God bless me. I'm staying right here. You know what I'm saying? We'll put some new paint on the walls and, and new furniture in the house. And let's go. So, so God's plan is, is to move. God's promise was to provide. So he looked at Jacob and he said, hey, you can't live here with Laban. You need to move. And, and when he said move, he knew that he was going to have to face his anxiety, face his fear, face his frustration, and face the possibility that Esau would kill him. Boy, that's a lot of stress. And he had to move two women with 11 kids. Can you imagine that? Two women, 11 kids. We are going. Like, like, like we, are not, we don't have a moving company. Look at us. Giddy up. Let's go. We're, we're, we're going to this thing. And, and he had to face those things. But God wanted him to know that he didn't belong where he was. He belonged where God's promise was. See, some of us get too comfortable where we don't belong. And we try to talk ourselves out of what God wants to really do in our lives. His promise and his plan, he can provide and he can open up doors that nobody else can. So I need to like keep moving forward. I need to keep looking at what God's doing. Here's what, here's what, you know, Jacob's wrestling. I think one thing he was wrestling with was that plan. Like, was this really God? You ever been there? Like, like, like you're so busy doing everything else and you can't slow down enough just to listen to what God says. See, that's what happened when he sent his whole family across the river and he stayed by himself. I wonder if he was thinking about the dream he had. I wonder if he was thinking about when God spoke to him because it says in the first in the chapter before that, he starts laying it all out and saying, God, here's the thing. You said that you would bless me. You said that we would prosper. You said that I need to go back, but I got Esau. And Esau doesn't like me. Esau really wants to kill me. Are you sure this is your plan? You ever questioned God's plan before? When God's plan says to forgive, when God's plan says to, to love, how, you know, there's, there's times in our lives where it's, where it's very hard to love, but it's still God's plan because the promise of provision is attached to his plan. So his plan was better and greater than Jacob's. He was already blessed. He was already prospered, but he said, I'm going to bless your, and I'm going to bless everybody through you. But if you stay over here, it's not going to happen. See, I love what, what, what Jacob's response and, and when the, when the, when he's wrestling with this whole thing. And the guy's like, let him, let me go, let me go, let me go. And he's like, I won't let go unless you bless me. What would cause you to let go of God's plan? What would cause you to like, like hold on to something else? For some of us, we, it, it, it's like, it's too hard to hold on. So we let go because something else is offered to us. There's a different offering that, okay, what about this plan? Or what about this plan? And we try to, we try to, you ever try to do this? Try to weigh out which plan is, plan is the best plan? And in the process of realizing which plan is the best plan, none of the plans are the best plan, but God's plan is always the right plan. Hello? Come on, stay with me on this one. At some point, we've got to realize that, that, that like what we did last week, it's like shifting gears. How many drive a, a manual transmission? Like, like you, you shift gear. Go ahead. Oh, wow. More in the serve. You drive one right now, okay? How many don't know how to drive one? I do know how to drive one. Okay. How many don't know how to drive a manual? Come on now. Ooh, it would be fun to teach you guys. I'm not doing it. Because <laughs> I remember when I taught my wife how to drive one. Boy, that was fun. Hello. When we got married, I'm like, all right, we're getting married. Hey, you got to drive this. She goes, I can't drive that thing. And I'm like, no, yes, you can. You know what I'm saying? You know, your greatest fear when you're learning how to drive a manual transmission is hills. Because anytime you get up to a hill and you got to stop, there's always some joker that wants to pull up behind you. And you're thinking, oh, I need the like, like, woo, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I need the time to let off the clutch, put on the gas and like, woo, and go. But, but in that moment, you like put your foot on the gas, the brake, everything. And you like pushing the gas. I figured out how to put my, my foot on the clutch, the brake and the gas at the same time, wave that thing, and then just drop it and woo, and peel out and take off. Anybody with me on that one? Who's with me? Why? Because it feels awesome. You know what I'm saying? It's just, and you're like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I do. I, like, I, I, I rented a car when we were overseas and, and it was one of those manual transmission type things. I'm like, boy, this is fun. I haven't done this in a while. You know what I'm saying? And then you pull up to the light and if you haven't done it for a while, you're like, your things hopping. You're like, like, what's going on? Something wrong. And then you realize, oh, put your clutch in dummy. You know, like, like put it down. You know, like, oh, that's what's wrong with it. And then I come home 
And I'm like pulling up to a light at Yellow Bluff Road in my car, automatic. And I'm like looking for the clutch. You know what I'm saying? Going, the whole time for like two days, because for seven days I was like doing this thing, you know? Like, and then I realized I don't have to do that thing anymore. <laughs> it, 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 when we get in the rhythm of doing the same thing over and over again, something new is harder at times. But when you realize that God's got something involved in that rhythm that's greater. See, the rhythm of, of walking around your neighborhood and praying over the houses is a new rhythm. But when you realize that eternity is shaped by the way that we pray and by the passion that's in our hearts, that God wants every single person to get saved. And we as a church, we stand between, between earth and hell and we say, not today, Satan. I'm going to try to get as many people as I possibly can. Who's with pastor that every person needs to hear the gospel? It's that rhythm that we take. So the first thing that happened is, is, is you get a new rhythm. So today's circle launch. Here's a new rhythm. Realize this, that, that your walk is impacted by how you're connected in community. I still believe that, that the church is the best answer for this world. Let me say that again. I still believe that the church is the answer for this world. That if Jesus said, I've come to build my church, build who? People, not buildings, people. When I come to build people, that the entire world will be shaped and encouraged because of what I do in them, how I build them. So if that's the context of what God's working in, then we're trying to just set you up to win at this thing and to succeed and realize that his plan is greater. Some of you might play like, like well, well, I'm just not made that way. I, I, I'm, I'm an introvert. I like to, I like quiet spaces. I like to be away from, I don't like full rooms. Guess what? This room will be over full uh, in, in, in every way in the near future. Hello? Because it is growing every single week. And, and what you're like, oh, uh, that's, not, that's not comfortable for me. If you only did what was comfortable for you, come on, think about what you wouldn't do. You wouldn't go to work. Hello? You wouldn't clean your house. Hello? You wouldn't even mow the yard. Like, that's not comfortable. I'm not doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, there's a lot of things that you do because they're right to do, but they're not comfortable to do. When it comes to faith, my job is not to just encourage you to do what's comfortable. That's not my job. My job is to open up his word and say, here's what community looks like. It's not easy. Sometimes it's messy. Get involved. Jump in. You're like, well, I didn't like that circle. Pick another one. Someone like, someone, I asked somebody what they were looking for in the first experience. I'm like, what are you looking for in a circle? And they're like, flexibility. I'm like, we're the most flexible people on the planet. Like, I just want to float in and float out. I was like, well, you, you need to show up, you know, but, but, but I'll, this lady right here, she'll be flexible. If you show up two out of the six times, guess what? You're going to think, oh, this is heaven on earth. You know what I'm saying? She looked at me and she's like, you're crazy, pastor. No, I'm trying to encourage you to take the first step. Because sometimes we get so uncomfortable with like, like the first time you shift gears. Guess what? If you stay in first gear the whole time, you're not getting anywhere. Everybody's going to pass you. But the minute you realize, man, I'm taking it. I'm, I'm going to shift into second. I'm going to join a circle. That's when you realize, wait a minute, that third gear is join a team. I'm going to get on a team and I'm going to serve. And that fourth gear is realizing that now I can do this mission thing. I can, I can do outreach. I can do what God wants me to do. And we start creating momentum because we're willing to shift. The shift takes place when you realize that God's got greater for you. So the first thing that happened to, to Jacob was, and it touched his hip and he walked with a limb. The second thing that happened is he, he looked at him and said, what's your name? What's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. See, Jacob realized that he was going to go back and he was probably going to be Jacob. Jacob means deceiver. Now, now understand this in, in the old Testament, they would name people by their, by their issues they would, we'd read the scriptures and we're like, we're like, there's people that in the Bible that are named based on what their issue was. Like, like, like this one, okay? Rahab the, Rahab the what? Harlot, prostitute. Oh, okay. You know, blind Bartimaeus, Simon the, so, so, so people are, are labeled in the, in the New Testament, Old Testament based on their issues. Some of us, we, we have labels and names that are placed on us. Like, like, like that person is angry. You know what I'm saying? You ever been that people like, that person's angry. <laughs> like, like we, we, call, we don't call them angry now. We call them a Karen. You know what I'm saying? Because that's a Karen. You know? <laughs> like, I'm like, wow, society has created some amazing labels that, that people like are, are being fulfilled. Like it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy of what they are. Now you look at the Old Testament Esau. Esau's born. What's Esau's name mean? Harry. 
He came out of the womb. Think of this. You're a mom. You're like, I'm giving birth to my son. And he comes out and he's covered in hair and it's red. And they go, let's name him Esau. Can you imagine being in middle school and you're like covered in hair? Esau, Esau, where's the hairy kid? You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's what our culture would do because they would label, what, what, what happened to Jacob? Jacob was like, 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 he comes out holding on to the heel of his brother. And they're like, oh, he's a heel grabber. His name is Jacob. That's what it means. Hello, he grabs on to the, to the heel. And, and, and in Hebrew, the idiom means deceiver. He looks at him and says, what's your name? Jacob. The Lord says, your name's not going to be Jacob anymore. It's going to be Esau. It's going to be Israel. See, Israel means God prevails. Israel means God rules. So what was God saying to him? I will prevail and I will rule even when you face Esau. Even when you face fear. Even when you face anxiety. Even when you face struggle, I will be there. You will prevail in this thing. See, see the labels has got to change. I love, you know, in the scripture, you got to realize I'm a follower of Christ. That means I'm a child of God. Sometimes you got to remind yourself. The enemy wants to remind you what you've done and how you failed. How many's ever failed before? Not like sixth grade, okay, or kindergarten, okay? How many's ever failed at life? You know, you've made a bad choice. You're like, ah. Oh. You know, like, like if you've wrecked a car before and your family members, like, like 10, 15 years ago, they still remind you that you totaled that car. There's an issue with that. Okay. They're trying to remind you of your past. And if you live in the past, you can't live in the present or experience the future. See, we all fail at different things, but when we live in the past, we'll never say Jacob was a deceiver. Look at, look, look in, in first Peter chapter two. If you're going to remind yourself, maybe remind yourself of what the writer said. He said this, you are a chosen people. Man, I'm chosen. Uh, you are a royal priesthood. Man, I'm a royal priest. I am a holy nation. I am God's special possession. Some of us need to realize that you are the treasure that Jesus came for. He came for you. He stepped out of heaven because you're a soul that he died for. As messy as life can be, guess what? I have a savior. His name is Jesus, and his grace is sufficient. Boy, that's a great place to clap. We say this around here, and if you've been to What's Next, you should go to What's Next. We say this all the time because this is a value that we live by. Our core value is this is home. We have more people that tell us, like, like, like what do you experience when you come here? And they go, man, it feels like home. It feels like people really care. It feels like they're really open to, to life itself. And, and we say this all the time, like this is home. This is a place where you're seen, loved, and accepted because you matter. We know that God sees you. We know that you're loved by God. We do know that you got issues like we got issues because everyone has issues. But we know that when you're in an atmosphere that's like home, then you can be accepted and realize that God's plan and God's purpose is greater. And when I realize that, then I realize that I am somebody. I don't have to live up to everything that's around me. He says, your name will be not Jacob, but Israel. See, Jacob was about to walk into the promise. What if God was trying to remind him the simple truth? That God's plan was greater than Jacob's plan. What if God was trying to remind Jacob that day that, that his promise and his plan was greater than what he did in the past. See, if the enemy wants to remind us of our sin, wants to remind us of our shortcomings, wants to remind us of the things, maybe we just need to remind him that, wait a minute, I am a child of God. I am chosen. I am holy. I am God's special possession. I am moving in the right way. I'm not living in the past. I'm living in his presence. God's got a greater plan, so I'm not going to struggle and stress over this thing. Maybe God's trying to tell us today that his plan is greater than your past. As sordid as our past can be as full of issues and different things that our past can be. And, and sometimes when I say that, you're like, you start rehearsing in your mind what, what, what took place in the past. I'm here to remind you that your future is greater. That his presence will take you to places you've never dreamed of. That you'll find community with people that you've never en ever understood, but will make you better in every way. God's got a great plan for you, but, but we gotta just start walking with him. When we walk with Jesus and the worship team can come, here's what happens. Your walk is different. 
People start noticing it. It's not like you walk around with a limp, like, oh, I'm a follower of Christ, or, or you put on an Ocean Way t-shirt, like, woo, guess what? I'm a follower. No, it's that you care. It's that the love, it's the compassion, it's what the heart of Jesus starts being lived out in your daily walk. See, our walk should be different. Our name, if we're living up to self-defeating past, then our name needs to change. We need to realize that we are forgiven, that God does have a plan, that he does have greater that his plan is greater than ours could ever be. I love that Jacob, Jacob, is, he's, I wonder if he was thinking of that stairway and the promise that God gave him. When he was sitting on that side and he's wrestling, I think the Lord was telling me that he was wrestling with the plan of God. He was wrestling with God's promise. He was wrestling with his future. But it's what happened in that present situation that shifted everything for Jacob. It was when God spoke to him. It's when God touched his life. But it's mostly when he realized, see back then, he took that stone, he turned it on its end, and he poured oil on it, and he said, this is Bethel. Surely the Lord is in this place. This is where God is. And that's what we've got to realize, that we are Bethel. That God belongs in us. That when we worship him, it's his presence. It's his, he, he desires to be in you. That's why Jesus came to, to abide among you, to live among you. But in that same moment in Exodus chapter 32, or Genesis chapter 32, he realizes that he stands face to face with God. Understand this, there's absolutely nothing that keeps you out of the presence of God. That Jesus himself died on a cross and bridged the gap so that we can step into the holies of holies and bear our soul and say, this is who we are, Jesus. We belong in your presence. Sin doesn't belong, but we belong there. And you can do greater in us. And he calls that place Peniel, which means, yeah, I've struggled with, with man, but I've also struggled with God and I've overcame. Come on, some of us, our greatest struggle is the, is the perception of people around us. The greatest struggle is the fear and the anxiety of the people around us that, that weigh all those things around us. But God wants you to know today that he'll be with you, that he'll walk with you, and that he's got a plan and a promise that's greater than you. That's why he can call it Peniel. He gets up and he walks and he says, the sun rises. Guess what? A new day dawns tomorrow. And if we can see who God really is, then we can see the purpose and the plan that he has for all of us. We all fit into this thing that, that we call church and it's a community of believers that, that come together that we make one another just better at life. I don't know about you, but I need people in my life. I need someone that encourages me. There's enough of this world that wants to discourage me. There's enough of this world that probably, you know, go home and eat fried preacher and, and, and talk about, you know, whatever, you know. But I just love the fact when people can text me and, and go, hey, pastor, I'm with you. I got your back. I'm praying with you. Because I'm telling you that, that, to be honest with you, that the weight of the world sometimes is like, God, this thing is your baby. This is your church. It's not my church. It's his church. And we just want you to be glorified in the midst of it. So that's the moment we face our fears. That's the moment we face our anxiety. What has somebody said to you that keeps you from God's plan and God's purpose? Jacob, I believe, was talking to himself. Like, man, God, you said that you would bless me. You said that you would prosper. You said that people would be blessed through our family. But I gotta go back. And I gotta face the hardest thing. I gotta face a family member that wants to kill me because of what I did, because of how I deceived him. In that moment, he changes his name. He says, nope, God's going to overcome. God's going to prevail. God's going to rule in this situation. Maybe the one thing you can take away from today is God's going to rule in your situation. That God can prevail when you face anxiety, when you face fearful situation, when you face the perception you fast forward, you realize that he sends these groups of animals and he tells everybody 
that's taken this group of animals and said, hey, when you run into Esau, this is what you tell him. These sheep belong to my master Jacob, but they are a gift for Esau. And he kept sending these, these groups of, of animals as a gift. And then his family came and the same thing. And when, when Jacob finally crosses the river and, and runs into Esau, he's like, Esau's like, wait a minute, what are all these animals for? It's your family? What is this awesome? He's like, yeah, they're a gift for you. He goes, I don't need any of them. God has blessed and prospered my life. It is good to have you home. His whole life had changed. Sometimes our perception is, is what we think. But guess what? God deals with people behind the scenes. God hand handled that situation. He handled it before he even walked into it. His heart was like, God, I'm going to wrestle with you and wrestle with your plan. But I'm going to know that you are greater than what I'm facing. Maybe here today you'd, you'd say, Pastor, I, I want to I follow Christ. I just want to walk with him. What a beautiful moment to just say, Lord, I need you to be the savior of my soul. I need to follow you today. Would you pray with me today, Jesus? We just honor you today. God, I thank you for the, for the 10 plus people, Jesus, that responded in the first experience and said, Lord, I want to walk with you. I haven't been walking with you, but I'm going to walk with you because your plan is greater than my plan. And the promise that is attached to your plan is greater than what I've ever done and it's greater than whatever I can walk into. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to walk with Jesus. I want to follow him all the days of my life. When I say three, I just want you to wave at me and I'm just going to pray with you right where you're sitting. And it's, it's the decision you make to say, God, I'm going all in. I'm going to follow you. Would you make that decision today and say, Jesus, today's my day to say yes to you. That's you when I say three, just wave at me. Ready? One, two, three, just wave at Pastor. You're like, that's me, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Come on, if you waved or didn't wave, your next step is a simple step. Right where you're sitting. Let's pray this simple prayer. It sounds like this. Jesus, today, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. I need you. Step into my life and forgive me of all my sins. I know you've got a plan. I know you've got a plan. So today, Jesus, I say yes to your plan. I say yes to your plan. I say yes to your promise. I say yes to I say yes to walking with you. I say yes to In Jesus' name. Amen. What an incredible Sunday here at Ocean Way Church. We hope that you were challenged just as much as we were. Listen, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we would love to take that next step with you. If you text the words, my decision to the number on the screen, we will reach out to you, pray with you, and talk to you about your next steps in your walk with the Lord. We also wanna thank you so much for your continued generosity to the church. There are five different ways to give, and you can find out what those are by texting give to the number on the screen. Now listen, I know that the online experience is incredible, but there is nothing like being in the house. So we hope to see you here next week at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Have a great week.